If you got your Bible tonight, go to Mark chapter number 5. Mark chapter number 5. What great truth in them songs. Some of them I ain't never heard before. And if they wasn't in the book, I'd think David was making them up. But great truth, great, great uh, doctrinal truth in those songs. If David didn't sing so high, I'd sing with him. But I can't reach that, Miss Beverly. I just can't do it. Mark chapter number five. Are you there? All right. Let's begin reading at verse number one. I'm going to read several verses so you can keep your seat. And I just got a simple thought, and we'll try to give it to you. Mark chapter number five and verse number one. The Bible says, They came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. He lived among the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart, and he broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus afar, he ran and fell down before him. And crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have you to do with me, Jesus, the Son of the Most High God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. For he was saying to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, What is your name? He replied, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged him earnestly not to send uh, not to send them out of the country. Now a great herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and they begged him, saying, Send us to the pigs. Let us enter them. So he gave them permission, and the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs. And the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the sea. And the herdsmen fled and told it in the city, and in the country. And the people came to see what it was that had happened. And they came to Jesus and saw the demon-possessed man, the one who had the legion, sitting there, clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. And those who had seen it described it to them, what had happened to the demon-possessed man and to the pigs. And they began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed with the demon begged him that he might, uh, he might be with him. And he did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim it in Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And everyone marveled. I want to talk to you tonight on the subject that Jesus can solve your problems. Somebody say amen. amen. Jesus can solve your problems, but he won't save you pigs. I like Mark chapter number five. There are chapters in the Bible that are what we would say is mountaintop chapters. Matthew, uh, Hebrews chapter number 11 is a mountaintop chapter. It's the Faith Hall of Fame, where it talks about, by faith, you know, Cain offered a better sacrifice, or Abel offered a better sacrifice. By faith, Abraham left his country. By faith, Moses lived for God and chose to suffer the afflictions of the people of God. It's that Faith Hall of Fame where we get to see all of those great people that God used throughout Scripture. I like Hebrews chapter number 11. I also like Luke chapter number 15. If Hebrews 11 is the Faith Hall of Fame, then Luke chapter number 15 is God's lost and found. I mean, it tells us about the lost sheep. The shepherd out there counting sheep. And he got to 99 and he was missing one and so he left the 99 and 
go to the one. And then it tells us about the, the widow who had lost her coin and she swept the, she lit a candle and swept the house and, and she went to look for it. And then we got the story of the, the, uh, the prodigal son, this lost son. I like Luke 15, but I also like Mark chapter number 5. For it's in Mark chapter number 5 that Jesus flexes his divine muscles. I mean, he shows us that, that he's not just a man, but he's the God-man. Like, he is really in charge. It's, it's, it's what I would call, Mark chapter number 5, the hall of the hopeless. Because if there was anybody that you would give up on, it's the people in Mark chapter number 5. We find this maniac who's possessed, not just with a demon, but with a legion of demon. And then we move down through the chapter. We find this woman with an issue of blood. She couldn't find a resolution. She couldn't get help. And then Jesus comes along. And then Jairus' uh, daughter dies. So not only does Jesus show that he is Lord over demons, that he's Lord over disease, but he's also Lord over the dead. Like he flexes his divine muscles and show us that he's God. I like Mark chapter number five. Mark chapter number five begins with this story of this, what's been called as the maniac of Gadara, the lunatic, the demon-possessed guy. And interesting, I want to I want to just point out a few things. Uh, but first, the description of the problem. This account, both here in Matthew and also in uh, Mark and Luke, this account of the maniac is the most detailed account of demon possession that we have in the Bible. Demon possession is when a demonic spirit. Uh, resides in a human body. And at times, the demon will show his own personality through the personality of the body that he is possessing. Demon possession is real, y'all. And it's a reality even today. And I think there's two dangerous extremes that we can fall into. Those who deny it altogether are fools. And those who spend all of their time talking about it are just as much a fool. There's a ditch on either side of it. However, tonight, I just kind of want to look into the story so we can see Jesus. Matter of fact, the point of the story is not the demon possession. The point of the story is Jesus. The point of the Bible is Jesus, all right? So the point of all of these stories is taking us to Christ. The Bible says that he was possessed for a long time. The Bible says that he, in, in Luke chapter number 8, he tells us that he was naked and living like an animal. He was living in the cemetery, in the tombs is what the Bible says. He was living in the cemetery among the dead and the decaying. Matter of fact, this, this was contrary to Jewish law. Not only was he violating common sense, but he was violating Jewish law. Y'all, I've never, I've never wanted to sit up, uh, set up a picnic at a cemetery. Uh, that's me. I know that there are families in the grieving process that like to go and spend time. I'm not throwing rocks at you, but me and my kids ain't playing softball in the cemetery. All right? It, it's, it's, it's not normal to want to live in the cemetery. That's not normal. If you want to live in the cemetery, you are not normal. And so what he is telling us is he is telling us that this guy has reached a far place. The Bible says that he had supernatural strength for they had tried to chain him. They had tried to tie him up to chain him. They had put him in shackles and bonds so that he couldn't hurt himself or anybody else. They was trying to get the dude some help and he had broke the chains. He was literally off the chain. It was a young people reference. Or maybe not so much. That was a my young people reference. 
He had supernatural strength. The man was tormented and self-destructive. He was cutting himself. He, was un, he had uncontrollable behavior. Strangely, when you look at this account of the demon-possessed guy, that he was just violently uncontrolled and shaken, and, and when you look at this account, there are whole denominations that say that if you get full of the Holy Ghost, that's the way you'll act. That you'll shake and, and, and run around and just be uncontrollable. Yeah. A bunch of weirdos is what they are. That, was not even, that wasn't even connected to the story. I just felt like it needed to be said. <laughs> We're talking about the description of the problem. At one time, don't miss this, at one time this dude had a life. He had a family. He had friends. He had people around him. But somewhere along the way, something happened, and now he was possessed. He was taken over. His behavior was affected, and his behavior convinced the villagers and the people who lived around him that he was unfit to be around them. So they sent him out. This is where he's at right now. Y'all, I remember... I remember my grandmother talking about cats and dogs used to have fits. Cat go outside and be crazy and, and acting stupid and, and granny would say that, that cat was having a fit. I believe all cats are demon possessed, by the way. In, in Sunday school this morning, we was taking up prayer requests and... Um, and we had to pray for one of them's cat that it wouldn't run away. And then another one's two cats that they wouldn't do something else. And I was thinking to myself, I, you know, I think that all cats, you know, all dogs go to heaven, but all cats probably go to hell. <laughs> if you've got cats at the house, listen, we'll have an altar call here in a minute. And you can get right with God. But <laughs> listen, listen. You remember dogs and cats. Some of you old timers, they'd have, they, they, they'd say, them, them animals just having fits. They're going crazy. You don't see that so much no more. But what you do see is people having fits. Y'all, we don't need to turn a blind eye. We also don't need to, to overdiagnose somebody else's problem. But we need to be aware that this happened and is still happening. The description of the problem. Guys, this dude was so bad, they put him out of town. But then we see in the text a demonstration of Jesus' power. The Bible says that when Jesus rolled up on the shore, this fellow came running to him, and the Bible says to work, he fell down at his feet and worshipped. The word worship literally means to bow down like a dog and lick one's feet. He had fell down. And then, look at the text. Let me see where it's at. Verse number... Uh, here it is. Verse number 7. And crying out loud, a loud voice, he said, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? Like this, this demon-possessed guy falls down, the Bible says, worships, and he calls Jesus by his proper name. Now, I'm going to come back to that for a minute. See, uh, Jesus, Jesus looks at him and says, what is your name? And the demon responds, my name is Legion. The Roman Legion was about 6,000, by the way. What he was saying is there's a bunch of us. But don't miss this. When he fell down and said, don't, don't torment me, Jesus, thou son of God, of the most high God, in calling him his proper name, in the background of this, there was a superstition that if you called somebody by their full name, then somehow you would have power over them. 
It's weird. But that's what was happening in this moment. It wasn't that the demon in this moment was surrendering. It was that he was superstitiously trying to gain the upper hand in the situation of what's going on. He said, there's a lot of us. We're organized. We know what we're doing. We're united. We're mighty. We're, we're, we're the stuff. We are legion. In Mark chapter number 5 and verse number 7, the demons demonstrated that they knew who Jesus was. They demonstrated that they could actually pray. They, the Bible says they begged him. It gives the idea of begging him earnestly. And it shows you that somebody can know who Jesus is. Somebody can pray and still not be right. Don't miss that. Somebody can pray. Somebody can know who Jesus is intellectually. Somebody can have all the right answers. The Bible says that demons know who he is and tremble. Jesus flexes his divine muscles and he casts all of these demons, this legion of demons into the swine. And all of this is introduction. I'm going somewhere. Thirdly, let me say a word about the destruction of these pigs. Spurgeon said, Satan would rather vex swine than to do no mischief at all. He's so destructive in his nature that he would rather kill off the swine than not be able to do anything. And when you read this story, you almost ask the question, well, why did Jesus send them into the swine? And I think the answer that we need to see is that Jesus was showing us their destructive nature. Like this isn't something to dance around with or fiddle around with or mess around with. It is destructive. The Bible says that the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. We don't play footsie with the devil. We don't, we don't mess around with that stuff because it destroys. It's destructive and it will kill you. Jesus allowed them to enter into the swine. It's interesting. The whole, the whole mode of this story it, it, it shifts into what should have been one of the greatest things. Y'all, I think it's safe to say that this maniac was a problem to the village. Could you imagine tucking your kids in at night and hearing some crazy fella down there in the cemetery hollering? You talk about nightmares, man. Summer wouldn't get a, get a wink of sleep, I promise you. Could you imagine sitting down at the supper table and hearing all of that going on down there? It was a problem for the villagers. They wanted that problem fixed. They didn't want to live with that problem. Matter of fact, they, they tried to get rid of that problem by sending him out <coughs> and he went to the cemetery among the dead and was still a problem. This was a problem to the people. And so Jesus pulls up, fixes the problem, and kills off all their pigs. And it's like, hang on a minute now. We wanted our problem fixed, but we didn't want it to, we didn't want it to cost us anything. <laughs> yeah, I like this story. Because we got some pigs, don't we? Y'all, I think it's safe to say, let me, let me just kind of be very practical. I think it's safe to say that every single one of us have got problems. I mean, we've got lost family members. We've got health concerns. I mean, we may have financial concerns. We're all worried about, you know, a virus. We're all worried about an election. We're, we've got problems. Y'all, man who is born of woman is a few days full of trouble is what the Bible says. We got them. And we want problems fixed. I, I don't know a near person who sits down amongst their problems and says, man, I sure do love my problems. 
and we're going to put you all in the cemetery, all right? If you love your problems, then, then something's wrong with you. We don't love our problems, and we want God to fix our problems. We want God to heal our disease and protect our children and save our family, but we don't want it to cost us anything. See, these villagers, when they found out what had happened, the Bible says that they were afraid. How interesting. They were more afraid of Jesus than they were of the maniac. You say, why, preacher? Let me take you back to the beginning of this story. Their superstitions was built on their traditions and what they thought. They had their comforts. They had their pigs. Let's call them pigs. They had their superstitions, their good luck charms. They had their little cliches. They had all of these things that they thought would protect them and help them. And now Jesus shows up and fixes all of it. And they're left with nothing. So not only has Jesus literally killed off all of, or the demons had literally killed off all of the swine, Jesus has also kicked out their crutches of superstition and they're left there holding nothing. And so what did they do? They said, all right, Jesus, enough is enough. You got to go. I believe with all of my heart that in our individual lives and in our church, we have the ability to do this. It's a danger. We want to see God work, don't we? We want to see God save. We want to see God move. We want to see uh, God work in a mighty way. But we want God to work according to our plans, not according to his plans. And if he works according to his plans and bypasses our plans, and he saves somebody that we're really not, uncom we're really not comfortable with, or if he brings somebody to church that maybe we've got a problem with, or if he fixes a relationship that you really want that thing to stay broken, or if God does something outside of what you've got set in your little box, and you get all whiny and fussy and upset, and, 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 and mad at God. God done, God done did this and he didn't do it like I wanted it done. You know what you're doing? You're acting like these stupid villagers. And they're like, all right, Jesus, enough's enough. I'm reminded of, of, of a lady prayed for her husband to get saved. I mean, he was lost. He was a drinker. He was a beater, you know, a run around her, you know, all of those things. And he prayed that God, she prayed that God would save him. And one day God did. And he started coming to church. Because that's what saved folks do. They come to church. If you're watching the live stream and you're not in church and somewhere else, you're not right with God. Um, amen goes right there. <clears throat> Any problems with that, you can call Slim. I forgot what I was... Oh, he started coming to church. And then he started coming on Sunday nights. Well, then he started coming to prayer meetings. Well, then he started tithing. And then he started getting involved and working. And he started reading his Bible. He started praying. And before long, that lady was like, hang on now. I wanted him just saved enough so he'd stop beating on me. But I didn't really want him all the way saved. Mm-hmm. It's a shining example of how we treat God. We want God to work within our box. I pray for my kids, as you ought to pray for your kids. I pray that God would open their eyes, open their hearts, save them at an early age. I pray that God would do great things in their life. 
But if God chooses to take them to Africa and I all of a sudden get upset with that, then I really didn't want God to work in their lives. So y'all, we got problems. Jesus can solve our problems, but he may have to kill some of your pigs to do it. In our life right now, you know, there's a, a term that I heard preached a lot growing up and that I don't hear preached much anymore, but it's this idea of surrender. This idea of a surrendered life. I mean, thank God for salvation. Yes, you need to be saved. But there's more after that. You know, it's not just come punch your ticket and we'll all go back to living like hell. No, there, there, this this idea of surrender, of laying our life down for the cause of Christ. God, you can do whatever you want. You can have my life lock, stock, and barrel. Listen to me. If it wasn't for the idea of surrender, you wouldn't have a preacher tonight. Amen. Or at least you wouldn't have this preacher it was a time in my life where I laid my life down. I didn't know what God wanted me to do. I'd only been saved uh, about six, uh, no, about uh, uh, three months. That's it. And I remember one, day, one night, man, I got under conviction. I was saved and I was still under conviction. Y'all, conviction is a good thing, by the way. God was a working on my heart. God was a dealing with me. And I prayed and I said, God, I don't know what you want out of my life. I was 16 years old. I said, God, I don't know what you want to do with my life, but whatever it is, I'll do it. And that's it. Like God didn't call me to preach. The heavens didn't open up. Nobody stuffed a thousand dollars in my pocket. It was just that. And over the next few months, God began to work on me. Six months later, God burdened my heart. We talk about the call to preach. We, we really don't know how to explain it. It's an inward working of God where God began to call me into the ministry and to preach. You know what I did? I thought about, listen, I grew up in a church where God liked to kill half a dozen people for running for the call of God. Like my brother's pastor, God was calling him to preach, and he went out, to, you know, he said, well, instead of preaching, I'll just work with the young people. And he jumped off a pier in the Ottawa River and broke his neck and liked to died. I know another, uh, another guy, God was calling him to preach. He said, I ain't going to preach, I'm going to go to the military. <laughs> he was jumping out of the back of a truck, and his ring got caught on a screw and ripped his whole finger off. Like, I grew up listening to stories like that. So when God started dealing with my heart, I said, all right, Lord, here I am. I may be some dumb, but I ain't plumb dumb. All right? And I remembered in my heart what I had done six months before that and said, God, whatever you want out of my life, you can have. I did not say, God, you can have my life, but not my finances. God, you can have my life, but not my time. God, I want you to use me, but I'm not giving up anything. You know what I did? I gave it all to him. Amen. I don't know why this is on my heart tonight. It's been, been a long, weird week, and been able to figure things out and still working through some things and I don't know why this is on my heart but I do know this that there is an idea and while it seems humorous that Jesus can solve our problems but he won't save our pigs there is a divine truth there God wants to use us that's an act of grace and mercy right there God wants to use us. But God is going to use willing vessels. He's not going to force you. Amen. He's not going to operate you like a robot. Now, he may know how to operate circumstances to get you to the place where you do give up, mm -hmm. but he's not going to force you. Amen. 
the time I was my kid's age, I remember hearing this idea. When I got older, sunk in. God is not interested in half-hearted Christians. D.L. Moody, that great evangelist, said that the world has yet to see what God could do with one man completely sold out to God. We've got, we've got good deacons around here. At least two out of three. <laughs> Figure out which one that third one is. <laughs> we've got good deacons. But listen to me. They're not going to be here forever. I mean, I wish they would because I really like them. Like, I mean that. Brother Gene, I, I want you to stick around. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yeah. But when something happens to these fellas, who's stepping up? I thank God for Slim. I do. He does a great job with the class. I thank God for Mike Brower, who teaches on Wednesday nights. I thank God for people who are willing to work and serve in places. But if you look at the majority of, of not only this church, but most churches, the major amount of work is carried on the back of silver-haired saints. Amen. Amen. Or salt and pepper. We'll give Slim a little bit of credit. <laughs> He's not quite silver here yet. Missy will die it for him. <laughs> if Slim comes to church with a head of black hair, listen, I'm going to be real uncomfortable with that. But from, from, from the top to the bottom, from the old to the young, we're never too old. We're never too young. God wants to use us. Jesus can solve your problems. I don't know what you got going on in your life. I don't know what you're praying for. I don't know, I don't know what it is, what your problem is. But why don't you stop holding on to a little bit and saying, God, please do something. I'm willing, to, I'm willing for whatever it takes except for this. Let go of that thing. Jesus can solve your problems, but he, won't so but he won't save your pigs. Amen. Our Father in heaven, Lord, God, I pray that you would break our hearts once again. There is a glorious gospel. Lord, you are a high king. This is a worthy work. God, I pray that you would break our hearts one more time for it. Lord, if there's places in my life, unsurrendered places in my life, God, may you absolutely kill it off. God, I want to serve you with my whole heart. I want to live for you with my whole heart. God, I want to reach this community. I want your name to be glorified. God, so many times my own flesh, my own will, my own motives, my own desires get in the way. God, my biggest problem is me. I've got a me problem. So God, I pray that you would crucify my flesh so that I could be used and totally surrendered. Lord, if you'll do that, be careful to thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I want to mention a couple of prayer requests.